Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. We are group three and we're going to be presenting the Villalobos expedition um, taken from the second volume of Glenn Robertson's The Philippine Islands. So we'll just really, we'll begin with a quick introduction of our group. Uh, so hello, my name is Leah Castro. I'm from 3AB History. Uh, Bea, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, I think Bea's frozen. Oh no. Okay. Oh, no. Um, uh, all right, go ahead, uh, Rafi. Uh, hi, I'm Rafi, I'm also from TAB History. Hi, I'm Kiko, also from 3AB History. Hi, I'm Elmo from AB Literature English. And then our other group mate is Bea Alejandro, she's also from 3AB History. Yes, I'm from 3AB Ayan, there. Okay. Sorry, my nap. Bea. It's okay, welcome back. All right. Um, that's our introductions done. Uh, let's proceed with our presentation. Okay, next slide, please, Rafi. All right, so we'll begin with who wrote the text. So uh, we're going to quickly discuss and give an introduction on the main contributors to the Philippine Islands and the other notable figures that have that are um, that contributed to our text. So uh, we'll begin with Emma Helen Blair and James Alexander Robertson. So um, as you can tell, the Philippine Islands is uh, is made famous because Blair and Robertson are is like their alternate name for the paper. So, um, born on September 12, 1851, in Wisconsin, Emma Helen Blair, or as we normally call her, Blair, is well known for her work as a historical editor and translator due to her mastery in the French and Spanish language. Upon graduating from Ripon College in 1872 and teaching at public schools, as well as working as a newspaper editor uh, for the Milwaukee Associated Charities, she pursued postgraduate studies at the Milwaukee, uh, sorry, at the University of Wisconsin, starting in 18, 1892. Um, in 1896, she became an assistant to Ruben Goldthwaites, a fellow historical writer and librarian, in translating, annotating, and editing um, around 73 volumes of the Jesuit relations. And then in 1903, she and James A. Robertson became associates, translating and editing the 55 volumes of the Philippine Islands that we read of today. As for James Alexander Robertson, born on August 19, 1873, in Pennsylvania, uh, much like his much like his colleagues, Robertson is a recognized American historian and archivist specializing in Philippine and Latin American history. <clears throat> Excuse me. Graduating from Edelbert College of Western Reserve University in 1896 with a PhD or a Bachelor of Philosophy, he worked with Blair compiling and translating the Philippine Islands. After the completion of his work on the Philippine Islands, in 1910, he moved to Manila where he worked as a librarian for the National Library of the Philippines for around six years. And during those six years, Robertson also helped establish and teach library science at the University of the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please, Rafi. The intention of the writers, as seen here on this slide, um, taken from a paper written by Cano, uh, the editors, Blaine Robertson, expressed in the general preface that they were to present Spanish documents and manuscripts to the public, quote, with the intention and hope of casting light on the great problems which confront the American people in the Philippines, and of furnishing authentic and trustworthy material for, uh, uh, for a thorough and scholarly history of the islands. Um, next slide, please. We'll touch more on their intentions later, or we'll add more details to that. So, um, although he was not the um, a direct contributor, We'll mention James A. Leroy, who was the director for the Philippine Islands, Volume 6 onwards. So James A. Leroy is known most for being secretary to Dean E. Worcester in the Philippine Commission in, in the 1900s. Uh, quite the controversial figures, actually. Their reputation was caused by their avid defense of U.S. colonial policy in the Philippines. Now, before becoming a director for the Philippine Islands, starting Volume 6 onwards, as I said previously, he heavily criticized Blair and Robertson's work. Um, by becoming the director, he had begun constructing the compilations in order to support American imperialist movements, discrediting and dismissing records that account the, contrib the contribution of the Spanish and Filipinos alike. Uh, we'll touch on this again later. And then next slide, please. Just to also add, uh, we have some more translators that contributed to the Philippine Islands. So these are some experts on Spanish America as well. We have Edward Gaylord Bourne, uh, Herbert E. Bolton, and Henry B. Lathrop. 
I would just like to add for this specific volume of the Philippine Islands, which is volume two for the Villalobos expedition, I had this credited specifically to James Robertson, who translated the, who mainly translated the document. Uh, that's all for a quick introduction on the contributors to the text. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before I go into the text that we were assigned, I first want to explain about the Philippine Islands itself. So the Arthur Clark Company wanted to publish a series of Spanish documents about the Philippines collected from different libraries and archives to translate them into English. This eventually became the 55 volume series called the Philippine Islands 1493 to 1898, also known as Blair and Robertson after its two authors. More specifically, our report focuses on the second volume out of 55, which details and summarizes the expeditions of four different voyagers sent by Spain to the Philippines, namely Loisa, Saavedra, Villalobos, and Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. So our report specifically focuses on Villalobos' journey to the Philippines because he is the voyager out of the four who spent the most time in Mindanao. And this volume uses a lot of letters in order to narrate or give a narrative about his journey going here to the Philippines. Next slide, please, Rafi. So before we go deeper into the text, I first want to introduce you to our sort of protagonist, uh, Roy Lopez de Villalobos. Um, he was born in around 1500 and he died in 1546. He was a Spanish explorer sent to the Philippine Islands in 1540. Um, he is described in the text as a man of great experiences in the matters of the sea. And he is most known for giving the name Las Islas Filipinas to the Philippines in order of King Philip II of Spain. He passed away on the 4th of April, 1546, in Ambon, Malucas Islands, in, in, in modern-day Indonesia. So next slide, please, Daphne. So I want to first off start with how this um, expedition started in the first place. So Villalobos was co commissioned in 1541 by Antonio de Mendoza, who was Spain's first colonial administrator to the New World, to send an expedition to Islas de Poniente, sorry if the pronunciation is wrong, which in Spanish means Islands of the West. So he was given four galleon ships on his journey, namely Santiago, San Antonio, San Jorge, San Juan de, de Letran, and one small galley named San Cristobal, and one Fusta, which is a smaller ship, like a lifeboat, named San Martin. And each ship had its own respective captain and crew. So Rafi, can you go back, please, the first slide? Ayan. Okay, so it is said that by February 29, 1544, they were said to have seen the islands of Bindanao, modern name Mindanao, San Juan, and San Antonio. Next slide, please, Rafi. So his group left Spain by around... Um, I forgot to mention that his group left Spain on All Saints Day, so November 1, 1542. So one of the vessels actually was badly damaged before reaching the island of Matalotes. And this journey was not easy for them because it was a really rough journey. Besides the weather conditions, they, ha they were said to have suffered from famine and sickness. Especially, um, this is especially clear when they reached the island of Sarangan, modern day Sarangani. So there, we can see that there on the on the map that they went to Sarangan, which is the tip of Mindanao. And food supplies was said to be low. And while at first they had sufficient supplies, of course, but since they were a lot of people, they had to later resort to eating animals on the island, such as dogs, cats, and rats. And when that didn't work, they also had to resort to eating unknown plants and bugs. These unconventional food sources were said to cause death and disease amongst crew members. The reason why they had to resort to hunting was because they weren't really welcomed by the natives, so they were, so they tried to attack and take the resources by force. But when they tried to do that, they realized that the natives fled instead. So next slide, please. So their fate changed when they arrived in Tandaya, which is located in either modern day Samar or Leyte. So they went to Visayas after that. And when they were there, they were well received by the natives. So they were able to leave their sick men there while the, while the others left to search for their missing comrades in Mindanao. But to no avail, they didn't find any. So when, when those who left to look for their lost comrades returned to Tandaya, they discovered that the sick men that they had left behind had already departed on the San Juan. And after a few months, Villalobos, forced by hunger, hostile natives, and being shipwrecked, 
had to go to Malukas, a Portuguese territory located in modern day Indonesia. So we took the journey from Visayas all the way to all the way to Malukas in Indonesia. And while they tried to negotiate with the Portuguese, it didn't really um fruit to anything successful because what ended up happening was they were sent, Villalobos and a lot of his men were sent to Ambon in modern day Indonesia and they were left in prison and that's where Villalobos eventually died. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so now for this portion, I'm going to be talking about the context of the work and its caveats to consider in order to um, recontextualize the work. So it should be noted that the main audience is the American people to educate them about the Philippines. As mentioned in Blair and Robertson's The Philippine Islands, the Arthur Clarke Company decided to publish a series of Spanish documents collected from different libraries and archives to translate them in English. Next slide, please. However, the intention behind these publications was to, and I quote, cast light on the great problems that confronted the American people in the Philippines. It should be noted that Leroy was the secretary of Dean C. Worcester, Worcester, the propagator of the evolutionary anthropology that supported imperialist America. At this point, the text became part of the American imperialist agenda. He was also close to William Howard Taft, the first Philippine civilian governor who would eventually become the 27th president of the United States. Cano states that in this new context from volume six onward, the, pre the prefaces and documents selected would have a specific purpose to discredit the Spanish administration. The Americans intended to discredit the Spanish administration by first examining how the Spanish government ruled over the Philippines. After examining the shortcomings of Spain, the United States then proceeded to promote the sense of freedom through education, which was something that had never been experienced by the Filipino people before. In spite of the anti-American movements in the Philippines, this eventually made the Filipinos less hostile towards its new colonizers. This juxtaposition of America against Spain would give more substance to the need of America to run the Philippines. Leroy eventually served as the new director of the Philippine Islands from vol volume six. However, his methods were highly selective. From there, he cherry picked which documents must be retained and which ones were to be ignored or omitted. Now, despite the question on its validity, it still retains its status as a primary source. And this is because it still contains letters translated from Spanish to English of individuals who were part of the expedition of Villalobos. However, Cano points out that multiple problems were found in the material when they identified mistranslations, misinterpretations, and decontextualizations. Next slide, please. One concrete example was even identified by one groupmate as they were checking the dates. First, you will see the king mentioned in March 28, 1541, was Felipe II. However, during this time, the king was Charles V, the, Ro the Holy Ro Roman Emperor. Next slide, please. In this image, the text states that Alvarado had made a contract with Mendoza in 1638. However, Pedro de Alvarado had passed away in 1541, so this would have been completely impossible. Next slide, please. Another example would be conflicting dates in the text where a priest claimed to have landed in Mindanao in February 29. Bolila Lobos had claimed that they landed in Banganga in Mindanao on February 2. Though it is easy to note that these could be considered a simple human error, it begs the question, what more of the text had not been properly examined and corrected? And given its selective nature, how could this text be fully trusted to begin with despite it being primary? Okay. Um, we selected three passages uh, that, in our opinion, need to be analyzed and taken note of. Uh, first of which is this particular passage from page 63 of the text, uh, a section of the contract between Antonio de Mendoza and Roy Lopez de Villalobos, which reads, uh, in case one vessel be separated from the fleet and reach any land, the captain must see that the natives are well treated. The men shall not enter their houses, towns, or temples, or talk to the women, nor shall they take anything to eat or any other articles. 
before you appoint a man who understands trading, uh, and he shall buy for all what they may need, and you shall try to find out the products of the land and to procure the specimens thereof and ascertain the character of the people and the land so that when we meet you there, you may advise me of everything and this most illustrious lordship may have knowledge of it all. Uh, we chose this particular passage because it highlights that in the art of colonizing, brute force is not always the best option. Uh, the Spanish conquistadors uh, recognized the importance of gathering uh, and fostering good relationship with the native so they can get more information about the people in the land so they can uh, create a better settlement. Uh, furthermore, they also understand the importance of gaining knowledge about the people themselves uh, in order to successfully subdue them. Um, Villa Lobos, however, was not successful on many occasions in gaining the trust of the natives uh, that they encounter in their expedition, which resulted in the many misfortunes that, they, that befell them. Um, the second passage we chose comes from the account of Garcia de Escalante Alvarado, who was with Villa Lobos, uh, dated August 7, 1548, which, which reads, um, Upon capturing this island, we found a quantity of porcelain uh, and some bells, which are different from ours, which they esteem highly in their festivity. Besides perfume of musk, amber, tivet, official storax, and aromatic and refinous perfume. With these, uh, they were well supplied and are accustomed to their use. Uh, and they buy these perfumes from Chinese who came to Mindanao and Philippines. The island that he was referring to is uh, Sarangani, which what with, they pointed out was in the southernmost uh, tip of um, Mindanao. Um, we chose this passage because it highlights that even though Sarangani was in the southernmost tip of Mindanao, um, it, it already been trading with the Chinese merchants from the north. Furthermore, the, these lines are indicative of the riches and the level of development present on the island. Uh, their ethnocentric point of view with the passage, uh, some bells, which are different from ours, highlights both the perceived exoticness of local products and the similarities with the technologies and uh, practices framed by their own culture. Uh, for our third passage, it talks about the various opposition facing the expedition. And here you can see the, the offensive arms of the inhabitants of these islands are cutlasses and daggers, lances, javelins, and other missile weapons, bows and arrows, and culverins. Their defensive arms are cotton corselets reaching to the feet and with sleeves, corselets made of wood and buffalo horn, and cuirasses made of bamboo and hardwood, which entirely cover them. Armor for the head is made of dogfish skin, which is very tough. In some islands, they have small pieces of artillery and a few arquebuses. So we chose this excerpt because in spite of the obvious racism and vilification felt within the narrator's tone, a significant sense of wariness can also be detected. Spanish and generally European colonization efforts are rooted in the application of a technological overmatch. To offset the numerical limitations feasible within the demands of the expedition, as well as maintain dominance in the interest of long-term imperial ambitions. Essentially, it's a pragmatic economy of force. However, the detailed recollection of the nature of the island's warriors shows that any attempts to establish colonial rule or even sustainable victory would be difficult. The presence of firearms and significant, even if deceptively primitive by comparison, militarization of local forces pose a definite challenge to the expedition. Next slide, please. Of note, this is still part of our third passage. We just uh, wish to focus on it further because it's relevant to the overall text. So this passage in particular highlights the unfamiliarity of the predicament. So they all, as a rule, possess poisonous herbs and use them and other poisons in their wars. They are universally treacherous and do not keep faith or know how to keep it. They observe the peace and friendship they have contracted only so long as they are not prepared to do anything else. And as soon as they are prepared to commit any act of knavery, they do not hesitate because of any peace and friendship that they have made. It's clear that the narrator's de demonization of these primitives and his inability to comprehend the culture and morality of their opponents betrays his vulnerability and doubt in established methods. It also ensures that collaboration, cooperation, and other diplomatic means would be a risky proposition 
given the questionability of their morals. It's also recalled previously that certain Spaniards and Portuguese were killed in trying to navigate the island. And you have to observe great caution just to simply survive. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the Villa Lobos expedition and the text itself serves as to the impermeable nature of Mindanao's social cultural borders. And the sort of patterns observed in this expedition, uh, you can see it resonate in the centuries to come. Despite the hostility of the peoples and indeed the geography itself, Mindanao held a thriving microcosm of Filipino civilization that lacked the social malleability of those in the other two islands, as you can see with the cooperation. The difficulties of the Spanish, the stringent security within the expedition and its personnel, and the constant financial dynamics meant to balance the leadership's various demands highlight the difficulties of 16th century travel and settlement, ensuring that any venture desired by the Europeans would not be without significant risk. Thank you. Thank you, yes, that concludes our presentation. Uh, next slide, please, Rafi, just to show our sources. So we only have two sources, uh, mainly the, Cano, uh, the paper by Cano and then the Blair and Robertson paper. Uh, but yes, next slide, Rafi. Thank you. Uh, we're open now for questions.